Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to do something a bit different. I'm going to be the guest today on the Psychology Podcast. I'm going to be interviewed by the physicist Sean Carroll about my new book, Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization, which is out this week. The book is a culmination of many years of my research and readings of the wisdom of the humanistic psychologists from the 30s to 60s. I think that a lot of their ideas about how to become our best selves, how to fully realize our potential and even transcend and have peak experiences, these most wondrous moments that make life worth living, even despite great times of great uncertainty, very important ideas that I'm trying to bring back. And I think Maslow matters more now than ever. So just a little bit of a bio about my interviewer today. Sean Carroll is a theoretical physicist specializing in quantum mechanics, gravitation, cosmology, statistical mechanics, and foundations of physics, with occasional dabblings elsewhere. Sean is research professor of physics at Caltech and external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. His latest book, Something Deeply Hidden, is about quantum mechanics, many worlds, and the emergence of space-time. His excellent podcast is called Mindscape, where he interviews smart people about interesting ideas. It was truly an honor for me to appear on his show, and I'm really excited to share that interview with you all today. Scott Barry Kaufman, welcome to the Mindscape podcast. Oh, thanks, Sean. I've been looking forward to this chat for a while. You know, I thought while thinking about this chat uh, that in some ways psychology is as ambitious as physics and cosmology, right? Like physics and cosmology tries to understand the whole universe, which is very big, but psychology tries to understand people, which are very complicated. (laughs) And the idea of writing a book that actually gives useful advice um, to people living their lives and how they think and things like that, it's a daunting task. So before we get into... Before we even get into the details, I mean, what are your thoughts about the hubris of yeah. being a psychologist and trying to help people with psychology? Okay, sure. Yeah, so I think in a lot of ways, one could make the argument that studying humans is more complicated than studying the universe. Oh, yeah. No, I get <laughs> more complicated, no you know, doubt. <laughs> well, it, it, it let me, I was like, let me elaborate, because I feel like that, those are fighting words, perhaps, for, you know, physicists. But I think that... You know, in some ways, humans are more unpredictable than, you know, the, you, you, we get the sun, you know, you get the sun. Okay, the sun rotates. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. No, 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 but I'm joking. But, um, you know, we, we, get, we get how the universe works in some ways, right? And there's a certain predictability or, or regularity there, right? Mm-hmm. But my gosh, studying humans is so confusing <laughs> because we... Uh, first of all, there's individual differences. And as you know, that's the area that I focus on yeah. mostly. I'm fascinated with human variation. And when you start looking at individual differences, then it's kind of like all bets are, are off in a sense. So some psychologists focus just on the universals, and that may give us a false sense of predictability about humans. But then you say, well, well, what if we look at the variation and then you realize, oh my gosh, like <laughs> these these general principles really break down because you have this a-hole who broke all the rules. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, it's, like, it's like with the universe, you don't have that many a-holes, you know, who go out, get out of line when you have the equation that's beautiful. When, when you come up with a beautiful equation, right? Am, am I right? You know, yeah, that no, sense? I mean, this is why it's not fighting words at all. Like, I think that <laughs> physicists and cosmologists be the first to agree that studying human beings is way more complicated. I mean, that's the beauty of physics is that it actually is <laughs> at heart super simple and elegant and, and pristine. But, but aside from, so, I, so we totally agree that human beings are complicated and hard. So what gives you the sort of, you know, how do you get through the day telling yourself, and nevertheless, I have really good insights to share with you all. Yeah, especially with all these replication crises happening and right. and the fact that a lot of things aren't, aren't um, coming out. Well, I think that 
it, it's mo- it's just there's a spirit and excitement of let me share with you what we discovered. But I th- I think that you have to have that humility as a psychologist to not say we've we've found it once and for all in in any sort of way and 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 not have such confidence that people can't change as well. Mm. You see, there's a lot of research on what is. And I think there's a dearth of research in psychology on what could be. You know, there, there. I mean, there are people to try to do interventions, and a lot of interventions don't work. But you do see this tendency, especially like in the intelligence field, for instance. There's been no good intervention. I'm going to say this, you know, yeah. right now. There's been no really strong intervention that has dramatically improved IQ scores. Right. And intelligence researchers, there's a bunch of intelligence researchers who almost get a glee from that finding, which I don't understand why there's a glee for it, you know, <laughs> but, but almost a sense of like, see, we told you intelligence, do, you know, not that it doesn't change, but that it's it's pretty genetically determined, you know, or influenced, very heavily influenced. And 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 yet I still want to maintain the spirit of, oh, that's interesting. Well, let's just keep well, trying, you know, like, like we shouldn't, it's not like we just stopped trying to do interventions just because uh, we haven't been able to find the one that, that really had a striking effect. You know? So you're interested in sort of the engineering and technology side of psychology as well as the science descriptive side of, techno- of psychology. Yeah, I think equally, which makes me weird, and not only weird, but it makes me it makes me have a, a fight within a civil war within myself because I have that was a phrase Maslow used. He's you know in terms of like trying to become integrated human beings. Uh-huh. You know, like, like we need to we need to transcend that civil war within ourselves. These 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 different sides of ourselves that are fighting each other. But you know, I have the scientist hat, and when that hat is on in full force, it does not really like the intervention right. hat or side <laughs> of myself, and when the intervention side of myself is on I'm like I'm not really into the scientist that much so it is it is an interesting sort of balance that I that I try to strike within myself well you mentioned uh, Maslow tell us about Maslow because we're, we're going to go into your new book this is coming out called transcendence is that right that's it's called transcend transcend it's a, it's a verb Got it. Transcend. Is, is, it, yes. is it like an order you're giving people or are you yes. telling that yes, imperative? Yes. Please transcend? Yes. Yes. That's the idea. It's an action, you know, action word uh, for sure. It, it's it's a, a hopefully a, a, an inspirational a North Star kind of book that kind of shows what humans could be. Well, and it builds on the work of Abraham Maslow. So tell us a little bit about who he is. I mean, we all, we've all heard of him, but fill us in as if we didn't know. Oh, good. I'm really glad you said that because I've had other people be like, well, no one's not good. good no who Maslow is. Why should anyone care about your book? I'm like, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> and so I like your attitude about that. Everyone knows who Maslow is. Well, I think most people who've taken an introductory psychology class, who have taken an introductory management class, have come across Maslow's writings. Yeah. For sure. I've come across, at least if they never even heard of Maslow, have come across that iconic pyramid. Now, so Abraham Maslow was a humanistic psychologist. Sorry, the pyramid the, is the hierarchy of needs that we're talking about. Correct. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's usually depicted as a pyramid where you have an order of needs that must be met before one can become everything they're capable of becoming, mm-hmm. self, which is labeled self-actualization. Now, this is the story. This is the, this is the story that's being told to so many introductory psychology management students and people who see it diagrammed on the internet. However, it turns out that Maslow never drew a pyramid. <laughs> and, uh, and there are so many misconceptions about the hierarchy of needs. It's, it's incorrect how, it, how it's been taught the past 60 years. <laughs> so it's he did incorrect. have a list of needs, a hierarchy, but he just never drew them in the form of a pyramid. Correct. He never conceptualized it in that way. His theory was very developmental. He made it very clear that we are constantly in this dynamic of moving two steps forward and one step back and that we can also that we can we can target multiple needs simultaneously we don't have to wait to to start self actualizing until everything else is done until we check all the boxes and also it's it, as i like to say in the book you know life is not a video game it's not mm-hmm. like we reach one level of the hierarchy like 
connection and then some voice from above is like, congrats, you've unlocked a Steam, <laughs> you know, like Mortal Kombat or something. Yes. It's just not, it's not the way the world works. And, and Mazel was very clear about that. So I really tried to infuse the spirit of what Mazel actually meant, as well as the rest of the humanistic psychologists. It really is an attempt more globally in this day and age, in this world today, to, to bring back a lot of the ideas of, of the humanistic psychologists that have been lost. But tell us what the hierarchy is. What are the levels? The original model, in Maslow, uh, and yeah. I revised it, I revised it, but in the original model, you had the safety needs, or sorry, you even had below that, you had physiological needs, okay, like food, water, shelter, and you had safety needs, need for a certain sense of predictability in your environment, and then you have belonging and love, and he lumped them together, which I've teased them apart, and we can talk about that in, mm-hmm. in my, my revised model, but he had love and belonging together, and then he had esteem needs, which is esteem from others. So you know, it's that not was a big component. Self esteem. It's the esteem that others hold us in? Both. I would say he he has two okay. sub components of that. Both esteem from others as well as our own self esteem. But I, the problem with that is it's hard to actually disentangle that because we do draw so much sure. of our own self esteem on the esteem of it's, it's almost like redundant in like ninety percent of humans. And then and but then you can get to the self actualized individual. So that's so that's the next level is self actualization. So they, it's a big it's a big leap. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's it's a it's I've always viewed that as quite a jump. I'm like okay, um, I feel uh, you know really pumped up ego wise. Boom! Now I can self-actualize. <laughs> I, I, you know, there seems to be a lot of steps along the way there, and and in in a lot of ways, that's what I try to do in my book is is connect those dots. And and I mean, I took self-actualization out as a stage. It's not because we. It's not like we ever reach. Again, life is not a video game. It's not like you ever reach self-actualization and then you win the princess or whatever. That was whatever my my video game metaphor <laughs> from <laughs> Mario, think, Mario Brothers. I think most yeah. people understand just in ordinary language the words you know, physiology, safety, love, belonging, esteem. But self-actualization, I'm betting most people heard either directly or indirectly from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what he meant by that concept? Maslow talks about it in different ways, but there's one... One quote he he used, if you give me a moment to actually find it, I really love this quote. It was the best description of self-actualization I could find. Okay, sure. So I found a unpublished essay that he really wanted to publish. It was He, he was calling it Critique of Self-Actualization. This was really his attempt. He really wanted to publish this before he died. And uh, instead, it was left in an unpublished uh, collection. But this is the quote, and I think this is this really gets the heart of what he really thought about self-actualization. We try to make a rose into a good rose rather than seek to change roses into lilies. It necessitates a pleasure in the self-actualization of a person who may be quite different from yourself. It even implies an ultimate respect and acknowledgement of the sacredness and uniqueness of each kind of person. So in a lot of ways, he viewed self-actualization as being able to real. it's that unique part of your human potentiality that is unique to you because these other forms of these other needs, these these basic needs that I mentioned are things we all share mm. and we're we're all striving toward. But the the focus of self-actualization is more on realizing that unique potential 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 within you that is in a lot of ways some people would call it your best self, you know, in modern day language, although I don't right. like that phrase. Yeah. Because I you know, I think that there's no such thing as the real self. Well I, I actually really don't like the phrase the real self because there's no such thing. <laughs> but you know, but you know, I think that's really what he was getting at was this this unique full potential of what we can offer the world. And and I do think he there are misconceptions about it as being selfish. So David Brooks, you know, the the New York Times columnist, mm-hmm. was hating on Maslow in a column a couple of years ago, and I was like, oh hell no! <laughs> you know, when I was reading the column. I was, so you're I, you're very pro got, Maslow, even though you update him. You're you know you're, yes, you're definitely in yes. his tradition. I view him as a good friend, yeah. you know, who I've never met, yeah. you know, and, and I, do, I do think as Maslow did, Maslow thought this too, that we could have friends that from prior generations, it, it may sound a bit creepy, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but we can, you know, we can really have such a fondness for someone and get to know them so well. I mean, I, I met his, uh, Maslow's daughter, uh, uh, only r- uh, remaining daughter and granddaughter, granddaughter Jeannie, who he had written about lovingly in his personal journal, personal diaries. Jeannie was three years old when Ma- when Maslow died, but 
he would say that Jeannie was the greatest source of my peak experiences in life. And mm. I, it kills me uh, that knowing that I won't be able to live to see how Jeannie turns out. So it was such a peak experience for me to meet Jeannie, you know, and, 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 and she's looking at me as we're talking, I'm geeking out over her grandfather. And she's like, my gosh, you know so much more about my grandfather than I know about my, uh, than, than I even care to know about my grandfather. And there was, there was something, there was something about that where I, I, it really made me feel a connection to him, even though I never met him, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. But um, the important, good. So that, that is very helpful to understanding self-actualization. And I do want to move on to your version of this. So I don't want to spend too much time, but I, I do want to tease out the idea that it's a hierarchy because this is both important, but also can be overdone and caricatured, right? The idea that it's a hierarchy being that first you solve all your physiological needs or secure them, and then then you go on to safety and then you go on to a love, et cetera. And is that the way it works? Is that the way Maslow thought it worked? Is that a, is that a good way of thinking about it? No, not that we must 100% satisfy something before we can go on to the next. That would be a misrepresentation. He, he argued at any given point in time, there's a certain percentage, certain fraction of each of those needs that we have satisfied. So right now I could ask, I could go down the list with you and ask you, you know, maybe your 60% connection, maybe your 90% esteem. <laughs> You're pretty, oh, yeah. <laughs> you have a lot of Twitter <laughs> followers. <laughs> That's the modern version. Maybe you're, uh, you know, very high in safety and, and then some other need, you know, if we talk about some of my needs that I added and we can go down the percentages. So I think he made it clear that at any given time we can target multiple needs simultaneously. We're not at a hundred percent on any of them. However, he did argue, he, he did make the case there was a hierarchy of prepotency is what he called it. And whenever I use that word, you know, people are like, what are you talking about? My, my, I try to use that word in my book. My publisher's like, no one's going to know what prepotency <laughs> means. Well, uh, now what does he mean by that? Well, I think he are he he did believe that there are certain needs that are he called deprivation needs. When we're deprived of these things, they they shift our entire worldview and and narrow in a sense they narrow our worldview to a particular worldview, and they really do make it harder to be all that we could become, which is self-actualization. So they really do get in the way of self-actualization. And I think that is quite right. I think that what he really emphasized is not this lockstep progression of the, of a triangle, you know, of like a, something that you have to climb, like a mountain you climb, but more of like an integrative process mm. where if you don't have well integrated some of these deprivation needs, the whole system is really going to be out of whack, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, actually it does, it does make sense. But Okay, so I think so there, but there's a hierarchy in the sense that, in Maslow's view, uh, some of these needs are a little bit more basic, even though you don't 100% satisfy them before moving on, as I think you correctly point out. There is, there are levels. They're not just a list in random order. Yes, there are levels which could be, are, I don't think that a firm scientific ground we can say that the precise there is a precise order because there's individual differences there are cultural differences in which of those are more prepotent than others we could probably all at the very basic level say that things like food water shelter yeah are essential i think we you know there's some things that are they're hard to argue universally but there are some cultures where esteem might be more important than connection or some that, cultures where sure. connection might be more important what i really wanted to emphasize was was this this distinction between I didn't want to get hung up on the precise order, but I wanted to talk about the dialect, the very interesting dialect, dialectical between security and growth, mm -hmm. and that's really what what Mazo was was fascinated with was that dialectical, and that leads us directly into your reimagining of it. So you've thrown away the pyramid, too boring, too uh, stationary. stationary. You have a new metaphor. Yes. So I think a sailboat offers at multiple levels, so to speak, a, a different, uh, a better conceptualization of what it means to live a good life or what it means just, to, just what it means to live life, period. You know, we're all in this vast unknown of the sea. We're all traveling in our, our own direction, but we're all in, in kind of the same a sea of unpredictability. We don't know when there's going to be waves coming. We have to secure our boat as much as possible before we can go anywhere. If there's a leak in our boat, if we're, there's severe deprivations, we're not going anywhere. Hmm. But once we can do that, 
we can feel safe and comfortable to open our sale. And, and, and how we open our sale also affects how, where we can go and how fast we can go and all these things. So I really think that the sailboat does a nice job of capturing that, that interaction between the boat and the sail or between safety and growth. Right. So you, if, if I understood it correctly, the hull of the boat sitting there in the water is the story of our security and, uh, you know, these needs that we absolutely have to have met. Whereas the sail of the boat and the air around it is the story of growth and change and trying to uh, move through life in the best way we can. Yes. And at the top of this sail is purpose and really having a clear, clear direction and being very focused and having the whole unit. So another thing I like about the sailboat metaphor is that it's all about an integration of a whole vehicle. It's the whole vehicle that travels through the ocean. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not climbing piece by piece different parts of you up this mountain. That It doesn't seem to be how humans or even how thermodynamic systems work, you right. know, like whole systems are greater than the sum of the parts. And that's, that's a big, big thing I, I try to emphasize in my book because I am into evolutionary psychology. I mean, I, I went through a phase of evolutionary psychology, maybe like 15 years ago where that, I thought it was the cat's pajamas. And, mm -hmm. and now what I want to do is I want to really show that humans can be greater than the sum of their parts. We're, we're not just identified with our modules. So I think there's something we can use the evolutionary approach to understand the, the parts of us, but I'm ultimately interested in how the whole organism deals with those paradoxes of human existence and, and lives their own good life in their own way. You know, how do they self-actualize in their own direction or as Maslow put it, in their own style? And to me, that's what's really, uh, really fascinating about humans, our ability to supersede or to become greater than the sum of the parts. And this is where the uniqueness of every person comes in, and you want to sort of emphasize yeah. that. Well, no, I ultimately want to emphasize transcendence. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll get there. That's like way for the future in the podcast. I want to, I want to, I want to get all of the layers on the table. So, okay, I mean, good, good, good. Uh, even though you have a different metaphor with the sailboard boat rather than the pyramid, you still have some needs, right? You still have a list of needs that we're meeting in the form of this sailboat. Do you, do you even call them needs still, or do you have a different name? I do call them needs. I call them okay. a basic. I call them human needs for sure. And there, this is. I call this the integrated hierarchy of needs. The revised hierarchy of. In, the revised integrated hierarchy of needs. Yes. Yes. Good. And so, which uh, which are the needs uh, associated with the hull of the boat? Safety, which I've mm -hmm. combined Maslow's physiological and safety needs into one, because I think there's so much research showing that how our body and mind are so interconnected and it made sense to talk about a general level uh, I should say level but I don't know what to call it now <laughs> you know <laughs> general process yeah in, in in which there's a we can be pitched into the state of psychological entropy the state of great uncertainty where there's too much unpredictable in our environment that our brain really is uh, full of fear and anxiety. And so that, that would be that stage. And that could happen from hunger. It could happen from having no food on your, on your table or, or a roof on your head, uh, on your head, excuse <laughs> me, above your head. <laughs> yep. <laughs> to, but it could also be living in an environment where you, there's a lot of violence in your environment that pervades your environment mm -hmm. or there's just things that are so unstable. So that, that would all be in, uh, under that, that aspect. And in the chapter on safety, you actually talk a lot about attachment uh, to other people. Um, so maybe that is not what comes to people's mind when you first start talking about safety. And it's, it's part of safety is, you know, having a house and food and water. But you're also, there's, uh, th that seems to be, I would have put that in connection, but you put it in safety, the attachment we have to other people. Yes, because the opposite of secure attachment is insecure attachment. When you're insecurely attached, there's such anxiety, especially if you're if you have the anxious attachment style. Mm -hmm. You're you're pitched into that state of uns, of of inserting anxiety where you don't trust people. See, I see trust as a really core part of this 
of this need for safety. So coherence in the environment, but also trust that your environment will be safe to me is a central part of this, this, this need. So an ability to treat other people like they're your friends, not your enemies. And that you can depend on them in times of, of, of great need. So yeah. that's, what's, that's what attachment theory is all about. Can I, do I have trust and confidence in this caregiver when we're, when we're a vulnerable, you know, and, and, and it's been studied a lot in children, but there are also been a lot of studies on adults as well. Like my relationship partner, do I, do I trust that when I, you know, when, when things really get tough, that, that they'll protect and, and help me in those situations? And as a working psychologist, you must know, I mean, you must be very familiar with all the different ways in which attachment is tricky, right? I mean, attachment to other people, like can, you can be overly attached, you can be clingy, right? You want to have that trust and respect for other people without, uh, I don't know, without getting in their way. I'm not sure how you would put it, but there's definitely a balance to be struck there. Absolutely. So not to get too nerdy about this, but it's, be- it's really good to view attachment styles as continuums not types. Uh-huh. I think that, that this type way of thinking has not really been very profitable for psychologists. And, and we really need to think about things as, and, and, and this applies to everything. I mean, this is, this is actually quite profound. I think it, a whole revision of the DSM needs to occur. So that could be a whole other mm-hmm. conversation where we view everything, all disorders as, as, as on a continuum. But if we view, there's two main dimensions that we all differ on, anxious attachment style and avoidant attachment style. Those are, those are the two fundamental dimensions we differ on. And, and, and there's no such thing as secure attachment type. None of us are, just like none of us are ever 100% self-actualized, none of us are ever 100% securely attached. So if you just have these two dimensions, anxious and avoidant attachment styles, you can actually create a space of, of different combinations of those two, of different ways that one can be insecurely attached. Or, or you can only, and then you can only conceptualize secure attachment, the extent to which both of those are high, if you see what I'm saying. So but explain to us what they are. What, what is an anxious attachment continuum and what is the avoidance? Well... This is the place to get nerdy. Go, go nuts. Can I really get, <laughs> get nerdy? Okay. Give, give me a moment. I actually say it. Sometimes I get in these moments where I, I've never said it better than I did in the book. So can I just find that part? Okay. Sure. So I think, so the anxious attachment dimension reflects a concern about being rejected and abandoned and is abandoned and is the product of beliefs about whether others will be for you in times of great need. The avoidant okay. attachment dimension has less to do with a sense of safety and more to do with how you regulate your emotions in response to stress, whether you use others as a, as a secure base or pull away and withdraw from them. Mm. Now, it's interesting because I, I've looked really closely into the literature and found something that I think is interesting, and that it's it's much more detrimental in mental health to score very, very high on the anxious dimension than the avoidant dimension. I found interestingly that there are a lot of people who score high on just the anxious, uh, sorry, who score very high on the, just the avoidance dimension, who are con- quite content with their life. Well, I was going to say from from the description you just gave, uh, it doesn't sound like one end or the other is clearly good and clearly bad. Uh, for the anxious one, yeah, being anxious is bad. Being less anxious is good, but how much of ourselves we secure through other people seems like there's a, a happy middle ground. Yes. I mean, there is a lot of research showing that if both of those dimensions are very, very low, so very, you're very low avoidance attachment, very low anxious attachment, it does tend to be correlated positively with lots of forms of well-being in life and, and, and okay. lots of other indicators of mental health, as well as even t- epigenetic research and, and how certain genes become activated in the, in the stress response. So working as a interaction or combination, I think is interesting. But there are people who aren't very anxious attachment at all, but are very high in avoidant. And, and that's an interesting combination I think has been understudied in the research literature. There, there are plenty of people who are actually quite fine being single, <laughs> you know, not being in a relationship. Mm-hmm. And we found uh, when not, we, uh, Dr. Keltner and their colleagues have, have have done some interesting research looking at different correlations between these different attachment styles and personality traits, and they found that those who who score very high on avoidant 
but not anxious, uh, they, they just don't score particularly high on compassion. They're just not high in compassion mm. and love. Like they don't report being a very love. Yeah, I'm not a loving person, but they actually report higher levels of contentment in life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think I totally it's interesting. That. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make this podcast a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you'll find videos of many of these conversations. Just search for The Psychology Podcast on YouTube. Third, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Finally, if you really want to show some love, you can donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says become a sponsor. Thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. So this is a good point to digress a little bit because you're mentioning, uh, you know, the research that's been done. I mean, how much of the conversation we're having here is based on data, is based on experiments and empirical research versus how much of it is a theory that you're hoping will be tested using data down the road? Oh my gosh. Well, if I may, if I, if I, I I don't know if I may, what I want to may do, but (laughs) if if I may toot toot my own horn in a second, I really meticulously tried to make sure everything I said in this book could be linked to, to robust studies. So I have a pretty Mm -hmm. extensive references list in the back. This was a lot of footnotes. Yes. Yeah. This was something that I've been working on for years and years and wanted to get right, or at least as right as could be in in the moment. So when you do, when you make choices like uh, collapsing Maslow's first two levels oh, into one, obsessed need, over it. like yeah, yeah. So you you but you looked at the data when you chose to do that. It's not just like an idea you had that sounded cool. That's exactly right. I mean, I obsessed over every little detail of this book. For instance, I mean, it gets really nerdy. I, I have some, uh, I put the most nerdy things in the footnotes. So you have to like, it's like, believe me when I say, like I say something like a throwaway line in the book, like, and modern personality psychologists have confirmed this model of security and growth, this distinction. But then I have like a, a big, huge footnote for for any nerds that want to go to the back of the book to see what I actually mean. And, and I actually link it to recent research on cybernetics. And, yeah. and research being done in artificial intelligence, not just in humans. I think that there's a whole, there are lots of different areas of human knowledge that are coalescing that, uh, that I think is quite exciting, pointing to this distinction that Maslow put out that we, that a whole system in order for it to fully, to be fully functioning, it needs both the ability to resist distractions, so stability, as well as plasticity the ability to have uh, come up with new goals. So you can get really, there's a level in which you can get, I can, I can like explain a lot of my decisions at the nerdiest <laughs> level. <laughs> Physicus is what I'm trying Excellent. to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's, let's get to some more of the decisions you're making here. So we're still in the hull of the boat. There's three needs that we talk about in the hull. One is the safety yes. that we just talked about. The next is connection. Yes. What does that mean? Yes, the need for connection is the the need to have at least a minimal number of intimate, mutually loving uh, or appreciating relationships in your life. And so this is more than just getting likes on Twitter. Correct. And this is this is a point I wanted to make because I had two sub needs that comprise connection, and that's the need for belonging and the need for intimacy. And I think a lot of mm. people in the field of psychology have conflated the two. Or maybe I've treated them as synonymous. But when I was really looking deep into the literature on belonging, it seems like there are lots and lots of instances in which people strive for the need to belong. Uh, They may do so in a way that lacks intimacy. So 
you let's say you join a you violent extremism, you know, or you join a, a cult or, or a religious organization or a political organization because you have a desperate, desperate deprivation of the need to belong. You, and and the leaders of this thing you join don't care at all about you. I mean, they only care about you to the extent to which you are furthering their cause. But in what way right. is there a reciprocal, loving relationship there? So it seemed to me like both of those things are really important. And also for the loneliness epidemic, it, it, it dawned on me that there's so much of a deprivation of a need for belonging that people are, are going about it hope, in, in the hopes that it will satisfy that hole within themselves of loneliness. And then they're surprised when it never does, you know? Sorry, is there a loneliness epidemic? Well, I, it. I use that phrase. Then I had Steven Pinker on my podcast and he's like, he's like, I would not call that. He's like, if you look at the history of you, I'm like, yeah, I get your shtick. <laughs> Steven Pinker. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. I love him to death. Don't get me wrong. He's a, he's a friend and, and, and all the good things about him, but he's got, he likes to take the long, long, long view. And I'm like, yes, but that's cold comfort for the billions of people on this planet who in this generation right now in this moment of history uh, would qu- would quite characterize it as an epidemic do you know what i'm saying but w- well tell me i mean yeah. what do you mean by the loneliness epidemic well there the the the, the, the rates especially among the elderly are quite staggering of of reports just simple reports of loneliness like if you do self report questionnaires and you ask people to report how lonely they are and it is really high among among the elderly, but you also see it even in college students. You see the, the the rates are high, and 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 not just the rates, but the impact of loneliness. John Capiopo, I, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. He was a loneliness researcher, and unfortunately passed away as I was researching the book. But he had shown that that the effects of loneliness on our physical health is is even greater than smoking or obesity or mm. lots of other factors that we know are are uh, are risk factors for mortality. But, but this is a but you're saying that there is a you know a quantitative difference in the amount of loneliness now versus uh, when versus last year yes. versus so, 100 years ago? Yes. So that is so that is a if, if we want to look take the long long view, I could get on board a pinker sort of argument that it's not technically an epidemic because it's hard to make the case that this generation is lonelier than uh, the hippies were, for instance, you know, in the 60s. And I think there is a point there that could be made. So perhaps we shouldn't call it. And I, and I want to say something as well, because I am very open to being, you know, for people making these arguments. I, after my podcast chat I had with Steven Pinker, I went back in my book and actually changed my book and I took, I think I took out the word epidemic. <laughs> so but, uh, but yeah. I'm, just, I'm just trying yeah. to understand is yeah. the claim that loneliness is increasing or is the claim simply that there's a lot of it? <laughs> there's a lot of it. I want, okay. I, I want to focus on the, Oh, there's a lot of it. Yeah. Aspect. And I don't want to get stuck too much on, you know, making it a competition of some sort with, with, with prior epics or, or generations, you know, but it sure. is no. It, I mean, I, I can totally get on board with the idea. That there's a lot of loneliness that's right. out there. Almost by definition, it can be hidden from us because <laughs> yes. if other people are lonely, maybe we're not connecting with them, and the effects of it could be very bad. The effects. That's also what I wanted to focus on because I was that was mind-boggling to me to look into that literature and seeing just how strong an effect loneliness can have, not just on our minds but also our bodies and on mortality. And it's it's a risk factor for for death, so it, that's a greater risk factor than a lot of physical risk factors that people look at. And so that's where this connection need comes in. This is the second need in the Correct. hull of your sailboat. Correct. And how, how does it relate to the issue of uh, introverts versus extroverts? Right. I mean, uh, we're, we're introverts are having their day in the sun now. Uh, we have uh, we're cool. Susan Cain's book, uh, you know, let us love introverts again because it's not that they don't like people; it's just they need their own space. Is that is that uh, related to this need for connection somehow, one way or the other? I, I've done quite a bit of research on on introverts and extroverts dimension, but I actually see that as irrelevant to this need because okay. the need suggests a min I said minimal number we're talking about one or two 
And I think that is a need regardless of where you are on the introversion, extroversion dimension of personality. And we could have a whole separate podcast on the science, the latest science of introversion, because I'm super, super interested in that topic and I've written a lot about it. But I think that's a, that's actually a separate dimension. That that dimension of personality has more to do with your levels of assertiveness and your levels of mm-hmm. enthusiasm or, or what's called positive positive emotions uh, that are of the the high kind. So I think like introverts can have contentness and calmness, but you find extroverts tend to report higher levels of these other kinds of uh, static states, you know, all the time <laughs> and, and, and okay. also assertiveness. But that's so the connection the, yeah. need is more about having, you know, a small number of really solid stable. connections. Minimal number stable. of s- minimal number of stable and um and and intimate, so mutual relatedness. There's a relatedness aspect yeah. to it. That's right. Okay, good. And the third uh need within the hull of the boat is self-esteem. And you did put the word self in there. Yes. I, I just one more thing about introverts. Be you could be yeah. the most, you know. Introversion doesn't track antisociality. So, <laughs> this is a common misconception. So, no, you know, not at all, right? Yeah, and I know you know that. You know, I want to make that. This is why I think this is separate from this basic need. I mean, if, if we're we're talking something else, if you have this extreme sort of aversion of any human connection, well, then I think there's something else going on with you, which we could talk about later. Dark triad stuff, but yeah, that's not introversion. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah no. One hundred percent. So w- yeah. well. So maybe. That's what introversion is not. Why don't you tell us what introversion is? Oh boy. <laughs> well, th- this is why this is so co- this is so hotly contested because scientists have a different view of what introversion is from what everyday people on the internet who identify themselves, self-identify as introverts, think of themselves. So on the internet, if you ask most people, the introverts will say, well, it's how I recharge my batteries. You know, they'll say, yeah. it's, you know, do I get energized by people or not energized by people? Well, s- scientists view it more in terms of the levels of dopamine okay. and and social reward. So it's it's more simply a matter in the scientific literature of if you're an introvert, you simply get less reward from social information or, or from social rewards like uh, and, and that could conclude things like the possibility of getting esteem from person a person you're talking to or um, what, what you know not like what, being excited for lots of novel social situations that's why you tend to find that introverts tend to prefer a couple close people than going and networking yeah. with a million people it's because when you network with a million people your dopamine system is more activated than your oxytocin mm. system. And and I think it's just simply a matter, f- physiologically, introverts don't get as much dopamine release at the possibility for social reward with novel social encounters. I think that's technically all it, all that dimension means. But people... Okay, no, yeah, that make, does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it does, but now is there... <laughs> now I need a word for the feature that I need to be alone to get, have time to recharge my batteries. <laughs> Well, we can. What do we call that? I mean, there are some people who are energized by being out in public, and there are some people who are, you know, the energy seeps away when they're well, putting the effort into doing that. If you view it as a dopamine thing, though, it, which is what's really going on, then it, you can map it onto that in, in, in a way because dopamine predicts how much effort we are motivated to put into something. So if we're not getting a lot of dopamine push for something, it actually will take greater effort. It'll be more exhausting to put in the energy to do something. So they're, they're not wrong. So that metaphor of the, of the recharged battery thing, it can roughly be explained physiologically through what we know about the dopamine system as you have to work harder. Like introverts would have to put in more effort to be motivated and to, to, to talk to lots and lots of people. And and right. and you could see how it, it would ex- be exhausting to them quicker than extroverts. However, yeah, okay. I I did I, I wrote a paper showing that there there's some misconceptions here because there's been some studies showing that both introverts and extroverts do get tired. Extroverts do get tired from from at a certain point. We're just talking about thresholds. That's all personality sure. is. We're all human. 
like, you know, we're all, and this is a big point in my book, we're all human. We can get too stuck on these different types, personality types, not realizing that, look, you could talk to extroverts and they would still be able to resonate with that feeling of, yes, I've talked to too many people today. I need to sleep. <laughs> okay. They're human too. They're human too. So it, we're really just talking about thresholds. And I think that it can be explained physiologically through the dopamine system and how we know dopamine when you have, is an, dopamine can be an energizing force. Do you know what I mean? For things that are possibility of rewards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Okay. I think that, that that does clear something up. That's very useful. Yay. Um, and it's certainly separate from your notion of connection. So let's move on to self-esteem. Okay. That's the third need right there in the hull of the boat. So what do you mean by that? So self-esteem is, uh, and I talk, I, I focus on a healthy self-esteem, having a, which has two components, a healthy sense of self-worth of I'm good enough doesn't mean that I'm better mm -hmm. than others. And I, I go great pains to distinguish self-esteem from narcissism because they're different things and they have different developmental pathways. It's just I'm worthy. And the second component of, self, of a healthy self-esteem is mastery or some people call it self-competence or, or even just competence just or self-efficacy, a, a, a generalized form of self-efficacy. So across all the different areas of my life, I feel a general sense of... I'm in control of my life. I'm the driver of this life. I can do things. I can make things happen. I have agency. And the self-worth part is not just about agency. It is, it is a distinguishable component from competence. So with self-worth, it's more tied to social relations. Am I a valued uh, social partner? We tend to tie our self-worth to, to being viewed as a, uh, a, a social partner as well as liking or liking ourselves. Some people actually will call that component in the psychological literature, they'll call it self-liking versus self-competence. Mm. And they can actually come apart, these two forms of self-esteem. Uh, you, you can, so for instance, those who score very, very high in narcissism tend to feel a great sense of competence, almost an, exa uh, an exaggerated sense, but they don't actually like, they don't actually <laughs> like themselves that much. This is fascinating when you Man, get, that would, that would yeah. be terrible to be that kind of narcissist. <laughs> you can't even like yourself. Yeah. Why yeah. be a narcissist at all? Exactly. Well, that's so funny. They, well, they, they can fully admit, especially grandiose narcissists. And I actually distinguish between different types of narcissists. I tell you, I'm really nerdy. So like, you know, I could distinguish between vulnerable, more vulnerable, quiet, introverted form of narcissism from the more braggy, uh, braggadoso or whatever that, you know, mm -hmm. form of narcissism. But, but grandiose narcissists, they, they have such an inflated sense of their competence. But if you do these kinds of even implicit self-esteem measures, and you have measures like I'm a good person or I'm a good, I'm a valued social partner or I like myself, uh, but I think I'm, you know, I like myself. I'm, I, they, they're kind of neutral to negative on that aspect. <laughs> 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 All right. That's, that's good to know. We'll keep that. It's, it's helpful knowledge when we meet narcissists to go yeah. like, yeah, you probably are not happy with yourself. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Maybe that makes me a bad person that, yeah. I, want to, that I want to do that. Yeah. But, Okay, so that's security. We have it. We have it sussed, right? The Good. the water that our boat floats in and the boat itself are a story of safety and connection and self esteem. But you're you're kind of you know as, as important as those things are. Uh, you really get juiced up when we start talking about the sail and how we can move and how we can do things. That the growth aspect of all this. That's exactly right. The, the Maslow called it the growing tip. You know when you have a tree, there's a certain portion of the tree that, that grows much, much more than the other parts of the tree. Mm -hmm. And I always liked that metaphor of the growing tip. I thought that was kind of brilliant. But yeah, I'm really interested in what are these potentialities within us and humans that really help us grow and, uh, and evolve as a species. And, the, and your first one, you again, once again, have three needs uh, that we associate with this sale. The first one is exploration. So what does that That's mean? That's right. You, you could, in a way, uh, view these this whole thing as two two different triangles, <laughs> two different mm -hmm. two different hierarchies. When you're pitched in the state of security, and, and that's your whole world, that base is, is safety. But when you're in the growth realm of human existence, so you can actually have two different 
realms of human existence. I don't know if you knew that, Sean. <laughs> you, I didn't know. You, have the, you know, the d- deprivation form of human existence where everything becomes about you trying to impart on the world, you know, like you're making demands on the world, like feed me, uh, love me, yeah. um, uh, respect me. But when you're in the growth realm of existence, which is the, the realm we're entering now in this conversation, the base of that is exploration. Mm. So you're no longer, everything is not pivoting around the need to resolve a deprivation. Now everything revolves around a general spirit of actively entering the unknown. Right. You can exist from moment to moment, but you're going to seek out some new experiences. Correct. You're excited by the unknown as opposed to fearing it intensely, which is what you know psychological entropy is all about. Well, actually, let's let's talk about psychological entropy because Uh-oh. I just had a, a good, uh, I know, this is my thing, yeah. but I had a very interesting conversation with Carl Friston, the neuroscientist, yeah. who has a whole theory oh, yeah. of uh, free energy and so forth. And it gets very technical, but the, the very short version is that he thinks that brains uh, and even organisms uh, work to model the world in such a way so as to minimize yeah. the surprise that they experience. And uh, of course, one question was, you know, but... We seek out surprise all the time. <laughs> like we we do explore, we do read mystery novels or whatever. And his answer to that, which I thought was interesting, was that it's secretly a strategy on the part of the brain to anticipate the future. So be surprised now so that you have a more complete and flexible model of the world so as to minimize right. the total amount of surprise integrated over your future life. Do you think that makes sense? I do. I think that the the need for exploration evolved as a need all on its own, but it pr- primarily as a re- uh, anxiety reducing function. So I think that's consistent with what, what mm-hmm. he just, what he said. A- a- and also, yeah. by the way, I consulted these folks. Uh, I had Skype chats with the, this whole, the whole group, the, a lot of this, these people who's, who studied the physics of, of, ent- of entropy and trying to apply it to the brain. And I think that I could make, and I hope I did make a good case in the book for the need for exploration having its own evolved function and not being reduced to the need for safety or anxiety. But I, right. I do think it evolved in order to help us with that anxiety reducing functioning. It helps, you know, the more that we can prepare ahead of time and the more that we can reduce that uncertainty by actively seeking information. So I really connect the need for exploration with with the information seeking aspects of dopamine. So there's some recent research distinguishing between the social aspects of dopamine or the more uh, what are called appetitive rewards, cocaine, sex, you know, a, mm-hmm. a, a status. And there are dopamine pathways that get us really excited at the possibility of those things. And there are listeners that when I said those three things, <laughs> their their brain <laughs> their brain is particularly releasing it's just releasing the dopamine in the synapses like in mofo. But yeah. there are also and I suspect a lot of your listeners who just by the nerdier we get in this conversation, they also are releasing dopamine into mm. other dopamine projections more related to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And I think that's a really interesting new line of research in, in understanding how there might be dopamine pathways that give us excitement, the possibility of information, um, not just the possibility for mating opportunities. So you're saying that equations uh, yes. lead to dopamine release? Yes, I do. I think that there's um there's some good there's there's some there's some suggestive evidence that 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 may be a separate pathway. And I think it can still be debated. And we're still trying to understand: is it really just the same pathways? But uh, there's individual differences and, and et cetera. And, and there's there's ways that this can be argued. But I think that it is possible too. There are there are different pathways. There are pathways that project specifically to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and our working memory that gives us excitement when our working memory is active with with uh, with things that may give us greater information to survive and yeah i think this is your next book right here <laughs> you know why math releases dopamine like this is going to be absolutely killer there's there's i i know people who would buy this book scott i'm uh, telling you <laughs> uh, well yeah. but also it makes me wonder about there are since we're talking about the uniqueness of different individuals there are absolutely people who hate being in a routine and there are absolutely other people who love being in a routine, right? There are people who love having a job where you get to wear the same uniform every day. And there's other people who would find that, you know, uh, inner torment. Oh, yeah. So how do we 
distinguish between those people? Yes. How do we give them both space to be valid? Well, great. This is a great point. And this is where we get to the realm of individual differences. And as I talk about in the need for safety chapter, there are people who uh, maybe they have high in neuroticism, personality trait, high in they have obsessive compulsive disorder at a very high level or, or other things that give them an intense need to control the world. And that may be a more pressing need for them than the need for exploration. And I've spent, you know, maybe 10 years of my career studying the personality trait openness to experience, right. which predicts, you know, to the extent to which neuroticism predicts the need, the need for security, openness to experiences predicts the need for exploration. I think it, and these yeah. are these are elements in the big five personality inventory, right? Correct, correct. They're, they're, I just mentioned two of the big five, and we already went di deep into the extroversion introversion one. Yeah. So, which are the ones we have left to discuss today? We con conscient grit. We haven't talked about grit, conscientiousness, and we haven't talked about agreeableness, being a good person. Although we did kind of talk about a holes a little bit. Yeah, we we talked about agreeableness a little bit. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll have to get to uh, yeah. Yeah. conscientiousness. But your question is good, and and I wanted to make it clear that. While these are all basic, while these are all needs of humans, we do differ quite a bit in at, at different points in our life how pressing they are for us. So I think, regardless of our personality, I think contextually as well, these things, these needs can ebb and flow. But also based on our own temperament, we can these needs can can ebb and flow. There are some people that really do. I think genet, you know, genetics plays a role here. Care a lot more about being belonging and an intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that the lesson of what you're saying here is that, I mean, exploration is important as a part of this growth aspect of um, the needs, but it, it is something where you don't try to just push it to the maximum. You don't want to be surprised every moment of your life. There is a, an appropriate amount of newness and um, newness to experience and exploration for any one person given who they are and what they're interested in. Yes, I really do think that a, any fully functioning system requires both uh, safety and growth, security and growth. And it also, it, there's been other labels like I used earlier, like stability and plasticity. But I think any fully functioning system is going to have to reconcile with, with both at some point in their life. Good. Okay, the next uh, need on our sale is love. So you, uh, so it's interesting because you're you're putting love here in the growth part of the needs, not in the security part. <laughs> yeah, I did, and I wanted to separate. So one thing I I I did is I separate belonging from intimacy within the need for connection. But the other thing I want to do is I wanted to separate an unconditional form of love, a higher spiritual form of love entirely from connection. I wanted to get it out. Okay. I wanted to get it out of the boat and into, and into the <laughs> sail and into the sail. Because when you project that in your sail, you can do that to anyone. It doesn't have to be those, only the people you like or only the people you feel a sense of relatedness to. You can, so there's a more cosmic aspect to love. Yes, absolutely. It's an attitude. Love is an attitude, not necessarily a, a feeling. In fact, you could hate someone if, in terms of what the, the the feeling you know label we put hate on the on that feeling, but still have be love, and this is what Maslow talk called be love, love for the being of others, and the sacredness of others, even if they're different from who we, who our being is. We can just admire people for who they are, not what we're trying to get out of them, or what they can, or the usefulness they have for us. Even in the right. even at the level of connection, it's still about usefulness. Uh, you know, it. You know, you're still making demands on people to connect with me. <laughs> but mm. at the B love level of human existence, you don't make those sorts of demands. It's more that you're offering something to the world rather than just asking things of it. That's right. Okay, and and then the third need in the sale is purpose, and this is the one I want to talk about the most. But I'll I'll because I have my doubts. Uh, but I want to hear your sales pitch first. So. I can't wait to hear your your own thoughts on this. And, <laughs> I know because it's the most important one to you. I know. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't actually say it's the most important. If you, if you actually asked me to choose, I may actually choose like transcendence, which we're we're going in a second. You know, but 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 purpose. 
the point I wanted to make there is if I had to choose, I would choose the integration of them all. <laughs> then sure. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. That's that's the, that's like uh, that's like the spoiler. That's the spoiler. Totally the, cheating. But yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but but purpose is it's a tough one to define. Although I do have a precise definition in the book. How did I define it? The need for purpose can be defined as the need for an overarching aspiration that energizes one's efforts and provides a central source of meaning and significance in one's life. The way I think about purpose, and we can have multiple purposes, but it's a more superordinate goal, and it it serves as an organizing framework, so to speak, for all of our other goals, so that we can... Mm-hmm see if our other goals in our hierarchy, maybe at, at less abstract levels or broad levels of abstraction, are working together as a, as a whole unit in making sure that we're realizing that highest level goal or aspiration or one could just colloquially call it a dream. <laughs> dream! If we've mm-hmm. lost everyone and what I just said, we could say just having a dream, you know, a really broad dream, making sure that we really can reach it to our full capacity, that we're not having things that are taking away unnecessarily from our capacity to realize that dream. But I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I I completely agree that um, having a purpose of the form that you talk about um, can really help, right? Can really give somebody momentum, direction, uh, and fulfillment in their lives. Uh, but I, but I have a bunch of questions. One of which is, do we really need that? I mean, can people be just as happy without some sort of big picture future goal in mind? Can can, yes. can there be real more living in the moment without necessarily having a purpose? And can that be just as rewarding? Yeah. And I'm not, I'm, this is a legitimate question. It's not like a leading question. Like I'm, yes. I'm open to whatever the answer might be. So yes, and it's a terrific, terrific question. It's one that I had quite a bit back and forth with Ken and Sheldon, who did a lot of the research that I tried to synthesize in that chapter. He doesn't talk about, he doesn't use the word purpose. He talks about self-concordant goals, the importance of setting the right goals that will lead to growth. And I when I told him I was kind of framing this in terms of purpose and everything, he was very skeptical of that. And he, you know, he said, well, like I teach my students, don't worry about this purpose. It's so dramatic, it sounds so dramatic and daunting, <laughs> you know, um, but you know, there, I'm also can be a bit of a dramatic person too. So it, purpose re- okay. yeah, resonates more with my being, you know, like, like there's, yeah. there's something exciting and thrilling about, about, uh, about having a, a, a superordinate goal that, that gives you like like a hierarchy of meaning in your life, you know? There, there, like I think it's fair to say there are some goals you have that give you a deeper sense of meaning than other goals. You know, like the goal to just get out of bed in the morning, you know, is not is not your purpose in life, you know, but it's an important goal. Well, yeah. I mean, this is where, I mean, this is what I, if I were to be more playing the devil's advocate, which I sometimes try to do you know, in the it. podcast I context. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the criticisms against Maslow was that it was a little elitist, his conception of psychology, right? Like he was looking at the people who had been most successful in life. Not successful. Um, I would correct you there. He did, he did not equate self-actualization with achievement. Okay, but he was looking at people like Gandhi and Einstein and so forth, right? I mean, he was not looking at people who he met randomly on the street. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Although he, <laughs> he, I saw an interview with his, uh, a very precious interview with his uh, wife, Bertha, after Maslow died. And they're interviewing, you know, her about how he th- thought about self-actualization. And she said, you know, Abe really thought my mother was self-actualized, was m- way more self-actualized than he thought he himself was. And his, and, and his, his mother was really a good, a good kind, her, her mother was a good kind person, but not a, not someone who had achieved a lot. And yeah. if you actually look at Maslow's writings, he, he started off the whole idea of self actualization He started what's called, what he called the good human being notebook. He was mm-hmm. just taking down notes of who he thought were the, the best specimens of humanity in the sense that they were good people. And I think that gets uh-huh. lost a lot in, in, in this notion of self actualization and actually the spirit upon which he went into this, he thought that self actualized people represent what's best in humanity, but not, but he did not equate it with high achievement. Okay. That aside, Maslow's okay. individual uh, thoughts aside, I, I <laughs> think that there is a danger because it's not, so, I mean, for you, it might've been Maslow for me. Um, 
When I think about people in moral philosophy, for example, like John Stuart Mill trying to make distinctions between higher and lower pleasures, or people who talk about the meaning of life and they associate it with, you know, some sort of creative work or um, changing the world in some way. And all of this sounds, and you know, I have those uh, goals and purposes myself, but the idea that that's what it should be does uh, uh, sound a little bit elitist to me. I think that there's plenty of space out there, again, playing the devil's advocate, yeah. for just living, for just saying like, no, I don't wake up in the morning like with my grand plan. I just want to like be good at the day and I, I can find meaningfulness in the competency and compassion with which I approach the everyday small things. And I, I if you, if you want to say, well, that counts as a purpose, then that's fine. But I don't think it's what people think of when you say the word purpose. Mm, I think you're right. And you know, if, if if you want to talk about transcendence, it's, we, we do, we do. At but. some point, there there is a kind of a there is a grand reveal, or not grand reveal. There is a a twist. There's a twist ending to this book, and I've yeah, been holding right. off on it because it's like I want people to read the book. But I, and, you know, there is a twist ending, and 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 and, okay, and, 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 and it gets to it. Get, what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> okay, M Night Shyamalan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm the M. Night Shyamalan of psychology. No, um, no, there that speaks directly to the heart of what you're saying. And and that was a twist of Maslow's as well, because he thought it was all about self-actualization, all about this grand purpose and mission, having a mission outside your and self. And then he faced his own mortality and mm. he suddenly didn't care about any of that stuff anymore. And right. it confused the heck out of him. And he wrote, you know, in his book, this is so strange that this experience of mortality, which has, in a sense, taken me all the way to the bottom, not of a pyramid, but, you know, uh, made me focus on this this lower need, has actually increased my sense of transcendence and appreciation of the world more than I've ever had in my entire life. And it has made me care less about the uh, the competitiveness drive or the achievement drive or the the ego so this was a real paradox that he was trying to work out in in the last year and a half of his life before he he did succumb to a heart attack at the age of sixty two suddenly, you know. You know, I think so. Yeah, this is good. I do want to sort of. Uh, I'm sorry about your book and your dramatic instincts. I want to totally spoil the ending of your book here in the podcast <laughs> and talk about <laughs> transcendence. But I do have one more question about purpose, which is sure. I think you know one that many people will have, which is. Where is it supposed to come from? I mean, can it be completely arbitrary? Does it matter which purpose we have? You know, there there are people here in the United States of America who, you know, build the world's largest ball of twine or something like yeah. that. And is well, that just as good as people who find a cure for cancer? Oh, just as good. Wow. Well, that's that's a heavy question. And 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 I would be the last one to to start to 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 claim I'm the arbitrator of <laughs> what whose purpose no, I think is, you are I think it's your job <laughs> <laughs> oh boy that's something but I, I want to emphasize that this is an integrated hierarchy of needs we can't view yeah. any one of these as separate from the whole system or the whole sailboat and 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 I've really thought this out I really thought this out at a very at a at a, at a very very uh, OCD level, <laughs> but you know if, if we're talking about building purpose on a foundation of exploration and love, that's the way of being that I think leads to the transcendence that I'm talking about, and yeah. I'm not talking about a purpose that's that's being driven by your deprivation needs like ego, and. Um, and the desperate need to, to to fulfill a hole within yourself. I do think that it, we can call it purpose, we can call it just a deep, deep, uh, or a goal that gives us a deep sense of satisfaction when we work toward it. If that, if that's mm -hmm. fine, we can get, let's get rid of the, we, for the purposes of this conversation, just so we're on the same page, we can get rid of the word purpose. And we just talk about a, 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 a dream, aspir an overarching aspiration, or, or even just a goal that is higher priority of meaning for us than other goals. Even just yeah. that, even just that at the basic level. 
and you combine that with a sense of exploration and a sense of be love for humanity. You, you, it's being driven by a a spirit of wanting to make the world, world a better place. I think those three things work as a as a whole unit in allowing us to transcend ourselves. And that's the point I wanted to make in the book. Good. I mean, maybe let's uh, let, let's focus more specifically in on transcendence. You know, when I read that part of your book, I, I, I thought of the Zen story about uh, the monk who was asked, you know, what is the difference in his life before and after he became enlightened? Stop me if you've heard this one, but he said, well, you know, before I came in, before I became enlightened, I would chop wood and carry water. And now that I'm enlightened, I chop wood and carry water. <laughs> That's yeah, it. That's I, the whole I have, story. But I have, he does it in an enlightened way now. Yes, <laughs> is yes. that is that related in some way to the idea of transcending the? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that he sort of the idea was he he conceptualized yes. it and perceived it and got a different kind of satisfaction from it post enlightenment. But his stuff that he was doing to get through the day was just the same stuff. That's exactly. That's right. That's very right. I love and I do love that. I talk about healthy transcendence as different from unhealthy transcendence. So. There's a lot of this, – this is an overarching framework for everything in life, by the way. I think everything in life is neither good or bad. It has a deprivation flavor to it and a growth flavor to it. And that mm-hmm. can apply to anything. You start to view the world that way, I think it really opens your eyes up to um, a lot. You know, you can have uh, deprivation humor, but you can, which is very self-deprecating and or maybe aggressive towards others. But you can have a more growth for growth-oriented form of humor. Um, you can have a, a form of aggression that is very deprivation motivated, but you can have kind of the Martin Luther King kind of aggression, which is like we're going to use this to uplift all of humanity. You can go down the line, you know. And I think the same applies to transcendence. I think you have a deprivation form of transcendence, which you. Uh, see in the world today with these so-called gurus who who claim to be above humanity. They're like, uh, so I'm not saying all the gurus, but I'm not trying to piss off the whole all of the gurus here. But I'm saying there are some that you see they abuse their position of power. You see that they 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 sort of have this. It's 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 being it's being motivated clearly as I see it through narcissism and mm. and through. Uh, these 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 security needs not through growth through growth, but I do think there's a form of healthy transcendence that sits um, that's well integrated, and and is not about being above humanity, but it's about being a part of humanity as much as possible. And I think that's very that's different. Those are different uh, conceptualizations of what transcendence means. And the kind I'm talking about is a is a is a sense of great great connectedness to the rest of humanity, just by being who you are. I'm not saying that it's you are sacrificing yourself. There's a high level of integration mm-hmm. where at the highest level of integration, there's a, a seamlessness between you and the world. Okay, no, no, that's that's very good. The seamlessness between you and the world, I think, is a very powerful image. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, in fact, it answers the question I was just going to ask, which is the word transcend or transcendence uh, kind of begs a question about what is it that we are transcending? And uh, do you have a simple answer to that? Is, is it a thing that we're transcending or is it more vague than that? Well, one could at the most simplistic level say you're transcending the ego. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then good. and then that's a very simplistic way of saying it. And then one would say, well, what is the ego? And, and I would define... The ego could be defined in a million different ways, and then and then the self has a, a million different definitions. <laughs> but for sure. purposes of our conversation, one could define the ego as all those aspects of ourself that are are the defensive aspects of ourself are the ones that tie us to security as much as possible and to uh, the relief from risk and p- the potential for pain. It, it's our defense mechanisms. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of ways, it, it it really is transcending, no longer needing, no longer needing our needs in a way. Got it. So the, it's the needs that are being transcended or the Correct. need for our needs. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Okay. Very good. Uh, good. Is that, is that, uh, people should read your book to find out more. I don't want them to think <laughs> that they learned everything. There's a long book full of footnotes and a lot more detail than we were able to get into here. Thank you. I appreciate that. There is, there's more, but you've really given me quite the opportunity here today to, to really get, I hope not in the weeds. 
<laughs> hoping that no, we like it, the weeds. The weeds <laughs> is where we live. This is what. Believe me, I'm going to get a million comments on YouTube saying thank you for going into the weeds. Oh, More good. weeds, thicker I, weeds. I truly hope that people in, do uh, you know like to listen to us kind of nerd out at this level and that they can gain value from that because this is not your. I I realize this is not your kind of self help book that. I'm just telling you the five steps to lead a better life. And I do have an appendix of exercises, but I, I, I think and I, I, that there are enough people out there that don't want to just be told what to do. They, they want to know the theory be, and science behind it. And I try to balance both those things. But, but let's make it clear for potential readers. I mean, in the book and also on your website, you do have actual specific – uh, actionable items that people can do to try to help themselves yeah. uh, transcend in the sense you're talking about, right? I do. And a lot of these things I adapted from exercises, I call them growth challenges that I have my students do. I teach a course on the science of living well. And you see, I see transformations. This is not only tested through science in a formally peer-reviewed journal articles through hundreds and hundreds of students who have said that the, this way of thinking about the world and these kinds of exercises have helped them grow and transcend themselves in in in, in powerful ways. And and these exercises are, are are also a lot of them are not your standard sort of happiness exercises because happiness is not my goal here. My goal is growth. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, this is going to this is going to be deflationary. But uh, I love the story in your book about Maslow moving to Brandeis and, you know, teaching the class. And then at the end, like the end of the semester, one of the students says, is this going to be on the test? Can you tell me what's going to be in the final? And he's like, you've learned nothing from anything yes. that I've taught you all, all this course. <laughs> and ironically, that happened to me in my class. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I couldn't help but then relay the story of Maslow and I and I could that student I didn't appreciate that obviously. No, that, that I, that's gonna undermine that. I, yeah, well but, and of course yeah. you also have a podcast. Uh, let, let, tell people about your podcast so they know about that. Sure. So I have something I have a podcast called the Psychology Podcast that I've been doing. It's great that you're able to steal it to to sort of uh you know get that name before I got anyone it. else did. I got so it. That's very good marketing. Yeah, now others have to try to steal mine, but yeah, I got I didn't yeah. steal anything. Yeah. I got You didn't steal uh, it. Yeah, I, yeah, that was a mistake. Uh, no, I know, yeah, I know. You, you you were there first. I was there first and I it's just such a great opportunity for me uh, to find the leading psychologists, maybe even names of psychologists that, that, that aren't the household psychologist names, but I could still give them a platform because I still think they're leading and they're doing great mm-hmm. stuff and discussing all aspects of, 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 of the human mind and human nature. I, and human variation. I, nothing, nothing's off, off, off limits <laughs> with, you know, for discussion respectfully yeah. and compassionately on my podcast. So that's been Great, great fun. I, I really hope. Uh, it, it, I think a lot. I really do believe a lot of the listeners of your podcast it would enjoy some of the episodes, um, if not a lot of the episodes of my podcast. Yeah, no, I think it's a great thought and a great place to end on. Scott Perry Kaufman, <laughs> thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you for having me on. It's been great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion below. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes, and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel, as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. Thanks for being such a great supporter of this podcast, and be sure to tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.